it's my pleasure to introduce uh, someone who's a, a commissioner that you know well. It's Dr. Bill Pink. He joined Grand Rapids Community College in 2015 as Vice President and Dean for Workforce Development, a position that was created specifically for him. His institution is Michigan's first community college. It was established in 1914. This father enrollment is over 12,600 students. Bill is a trustee for our regional creditor, the Higher Learning Commission. He serves on the board for the American Council on Education, was an inaugural Aspen Institute Presidential Fellow, was named 2019 Newsmaker of the Year for Education by the Grand Rapids Business Journal, and was named President of Grand Rapids Community College in 2017. And it's been a pleasure to watch his ascendancy as an effective and dynamic education leader for Grand Rapids in West Michigan. Beyond being a wonderful colleague, it's an honor to call him friend. Dr. Bill Pink, Bill, would you join me? Bill and I are the after-dinner entertainment. <laughs> Sorry. And as they would say in my family, we had some requests, but we're going to sing anyway. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about the partnership that we have between our institutions. And I think it's unique, it's special. And I think to understand this, you need to have a little bit of background about how higher education is organized in Michigan. Michigan public universities are the most autonomous public universities in the country. We are constitutionally autonomous. So there is not a statewide board of regents. There's not a coordinating committee. There's not even an office of higher education in, in our state capital. What we have is our, our public universities. We have the Michigan Association of State Universities, which is, which is headed by our CEO, Dan Hurley, who's a commissioner. Uh, and then there's the Michigan Community College Association that will soon be headed by, headed by Commissioner Brandy Johnson. But I think, and this is not to suggest that our approach is, is better or worse than systems, but this kind of flexibility gives us the ability to be incredibly nimble. Uh, we can develop and teach a degree in a year's time. If we're teaching something at Ferris that Bill would like on his campus, we can do that in six months. And I think that kind of nimbleness is what's needed in higher education. It's really capitalism is best because we can't compete for the same students we have to collaborate. And we're going to talk about this partnership we have at GRCC. It began in 1986. And what happened is the president at Grand Rapids Community College, the president first, they got together to offer uh, associate degrees at GRCC and bachelor's degrees at first that were going to be in technical fields that the employers need in that area. And then in 1991, we collaborated on a building, the Applied Technology Center at GRCC. And at that time, because the laws in the state of Michigan, the community college couldn't do the bonding on that building. So we actually were one of the bondholders for a while on that. And what we did is we created collaborative programs. But I think the bigger thing we had to do is to figure out how two different cultures work together and how two institutions that are spread 40 to 50 miles apart begin to think of each other as neighbors. And we think collaboration is a highlight, a hallmark of West Michigan. I think you've heard plenty of that while you've been here. But we think what we've done is extraordinarily special. Bill. Dave, thank you. And um, before I share with you a little bit more about what we do, I need to just call out um, someone I consider a great friend, a mentor, and an awesome partner in higher education. When I first became president at GRCC four and a half years ago, one of those individuals who came to my office and called up and we sat and talked was David Eisler. Because David truly cares about West Michigan. He truly cares about, and it's interesting to say this about a, about a university president, he truly cares about GRCC students. And that's not everywhere that you find a four-year university president that you feel as the community college president, you say, no, he cares about our students. And so we're going to miss David Eisler. We're going to miss the person he is. We're going to miss the leader he is. But we're going to miss the friend that he is to our college. So please help me in thanking David Eisler for what he does for this institution. 
All right, back on script. So, one of the things about what uh, David is talking about, these kind of things, when it comes to the relationship that he's talking about, these are all about transfer, right? If you can't put good transfer processes in place, I'm a believer that transfer truly is one of the biggest social justice equity issues of our time right now. Thank you. <laughs> because, friends, if we aren't making clear, obvious, and I call them highways, I don't call them pathways anymore. I call them highways because highways, you have on ramps and off ramps. That's who our students are. Our students at our school, in many times, they can't just get on a pathway and finish. They have to have a highway because our highways that we provide for them, they got to get off every once in a while because they got to get off and work a little bit. They got to get off and take care of family. They get back on the highway highway and they're back on that education highway to finish. If we're not making clear pathways for students to see how a highway that starts with us and truly can end with wherever they want it to be, then that whole idea of transfer just gets thrown out the window. And so one of the things that we have done in the time that I have spent uh, with the Aspen Institute in different ways, one of the things that we've been uh, working with the Aspen Institute on is that idea of transfer. And we had some conversations with Aspen and other leaders across the country on just what does it take? What is that secret sauce that should not be a secret about how we pr provide strong transfer highways and strong transfer, smooth transfer ways for our students to matriculate from the community college to the university. Here are some of the things. I just want to read this to you because I want you to think about this when you go back to your states and start asking the questions about relationships because that's what it really boils down to. Relationships. Whether it be relationships with the institution to institution, one of the things you're going to hear here with the Aspen research is that the relationship really sp speaks strongly for the relationship the presidents have. Listen to this. So the conclusion of some of this research is that presidents don't talk transfer with other presidents and transfer doesn't frequently get raised to the president's uh, attention internally. That's one of the biggest gaps is that presidents aren't paying enough attention. So here are five things they mentioned. Number one, presidents have a lot of priorities and transfer usually isn't at or near the top of the list. That's an issue because if it's not at the president's at the at near or at the top of the list, it probably doesn't get done. Number two, cabinet members and other core internal actors don't necessarily view transfer as a core priority. Therefore, they don't elevate it to the president's level. So if the if the cabinet, if the exec team, if the deans, the directors, the VPs, if they don't see it as a as a very strong and a very important thing to take care of and to pay attention to. They're never going to talk to us about it. Number three, presidents may view transfer as part of the university's diversity and equity work rather than as a distinct strategic priority. I say they need to be both. I think it is part of the strategic part of the institution, but it truly, as I said before, I believe it is something of, around diversity and equity that we have to pay attention to. And then number four, presidents and their institutions are held accountable by boards, accreditors, and state legislatures and the federal government for freshman enrollments and first-time student success, but usually not held accountable for transfer student access and success. That idea that if it's not front of mind, if it's not something that I'm being held accountable for, do I truly pay attention to it? And then the fifth thing, many four-year institution leaders, faculty, and staff view community colleges and their students through a quote-unquote deficit lens. Let me let that one sink in for a second. Because if you look at a student or an individual from a deficit lens, chances are you're probably not going to pay enough attention to or even enhance the quality of what you're doing with and for them. You're probably not going to pay as much attention because, well, that's just, that's the community college. 
Our data shows us that when our students transfer, this is not just GRCC, but you find this in many community colleges. When our students transfer, what we find is that they go to our four-year partners and they perform at or better than the native students at that university. So how dare you call a GRCC rate or something at a deficit lens? I get offended by that. You probably can tell a little bit. But what's important there, friends, is that, again, if the leader isn't paying good enough, is not paying attention, if the president and the leadership is not paying attention, you don't have relationships that we can, that we can brag about to you of what GRCC and Fair State do together. And there are many lives that have been affected by that. And I'll let David talk about that a little bit. And Bill, I would just affirm, what our data shows is that your students do better than our native students. And it's because you've taken the risk out of the equation. You've already taken the risk early on. Those students don't, don't come to us. When we began working together, and we have a third of their applied technology center building where we teach. So their students continue taking courses in their buildings without having to move, without, or have, without having to go 40 or 50 miles up the road. We started working with them in the field Fields, the technical fields that we do well, automotive, construction management, electronics, HVACR, manufacturing and plastics, because we do all those things at Ferris with four-year degrees. But we've added business, computer science, criminal justice, healthcare, hospitality management. He has the best culinary school in the entire world, absolutely. Uh, and teacher ed. Right now we do 18 bachelor's degree on their campus. And on occasions we've actually developed degrees that have started started first in Grand Rapids rather than our, on our campus in Big Rapids. We did that with digital animation and game design because the market was here when there was for us. We do six certificate programs and we do a graduate program in, in CJ. We do a lot more than that. We design three plus one programs where their students take three years at the community college and then one year for Ferris. So when you think about that from a student's perspective, they get the advantage of a lesser charged community college tuition than our tuition, which, which helps lower their debt, helps them get done more quickly. Uh, I really love this latest thing where we now have a relation, we have a doctor of pharmacy degree at Ferris and we now have an arrangement where five GRCC students will take their pre at GRCC and then move into our pharmacy program. And I'm, I'm really excited about the way that's going to work. The latest agreement that we've, we've, we've done is with the Futures for Frontliners and Michigan Reconnect programs that have been started in Michigan. Those are students who aren't typically going to come to Ferris. And those are students who may not have a, an aim to go beyond that associate degree. So what we're going to do is while they're at the community college, we're going to offer them up to 12 hours of Ferris credit. And we're going to do that at the industry community college rate because we think that will entice them to continue forward. But I think this is what partners do is you find ways that you work together to benefit students. The idea isn't to benefit the institution, it's to benefit the student. So GRCC is our largest transfer partner. About 20% of our community college transfers come from GRCC in the last decade. It's been almost 2,200 students have come to Ferris. About 1,200 have earned a degree and several hundred are still working on their degrees. But our relationship goes beyond that. We do a doctorate in community college leadership. We've had a number of his people come through our program and now two of their folks teach in our program. What we're still doing is what we set out to do, is we're trying to meet the educational needs that business and industry and employers have here in the West Michigan region. We think it's working really well, but one of the things you learn as a president is it's a lot better to let your students do the talking. So we'd like to introduce you to a student by the name of Paul Flynn. Uh, he began courses at GRCC in 1999. Uh, he's now the vice president for operations for Gentex. Gentex is a company of about 5,300 employees. They're right down the road in Zealand. They're a $2 billion company. And their expertise is what they do is they bend glass and then they attach elect electro optic swords. So when you look at your rear view mirror, your side view mirror, and that has electronics or dims, that's Gentex uh, technology. Um, but you know, and an example of cooperation, I contacted, contacted Paul, the people at GRCC did, did the video. So let's watch Paul Flynn. That's gonna have to be 
was in the 90s. I had just started at Gentex and uh, I needed to learn C++ uh, for a project at work and uh, reading it wasn't the way to do it. So I took a class here and uh, didn't master it, but certainly gained the skills that I needed for the project. Uh, it interested me a lot and I came back uh, two semesters later for um, Visual Basic 6 uh, and did that. Um, the experience built my confidence and I had wanted to finish my bachelor's degree and uh, looked at the opportunities that Ferris had for a manufacturing degree and uh, started uh, probably in 2001 or 2002 uh, toward that goal. Being a student in the cohort that I was in, there were many students in classes at GRCC uh, who were also with me at Ferris. They share the resources, they share uh, the ATC. The shared lab space was great. I enjoyed the experience and it did seem seamless to me. So I finished my bachelor's in 2006 and uh, worked uh, for a couple of years. And in 2008, I uh, decided to enroll and get my uh, MBA uh, through the Ferris program. That was a remote program, one of the first ones uh, in the country at the time, uh, but also had a concentration in design. Uh, so I experienced some classes over at Kendall. Getting my uh, degree in 2011, uh, there was a change of the company and I was able to get uh, the position that I'm working in now. Uh, Gentex has uh, been an amazing growth story over the last uh, 35 years. And uh, over the years, we've begun to recruit uh, from Ferris and from GRCC as well. Uh, the, uh, the operations there are very technical. Uh, we need people coming through mechatronics programs and through the maintenance programs. So uh, the relationship has stayed strong. Uh, right now, we, are, we have a great relationship with uh, GRCC and uh, we've uh, done some sponsoring of the new facility that's out in Holland. Uh, so we're excited uh, to continue to work with GRCC and Ferris uh, because our needs keep growing as the business grows. The type of people we encourage to go to GRCC and then to Ferris are folks that didn't have the opportunity to go to school uh, right after high school. Uh, they may come to us and work with us for a little while, and we see that they have some innate talents, especially in the mechanical and electrical areas. And we encourage them to uh, come here and to get uh, become a journeyman. Uh, electrician, which is uh, there's 4,000 hours of work time, but there's also several classes. Gentex has partnered with GRCC to provide those classes. Uh, but then for uh, engineering, uh, you know, emergent engineers, uh, they continue their education uh, through Ferris and get a manufacturing degree. Uh, we've had dozens of employees that have done that besides myself over the years, uh, and it's worked out really well for the company. GRCC, uh, I think, really gave me the confidence to know that I could be successful in education, uh, good, good grades, it was challenging, I felt like I was working very hard. And then Ferris offered the opportunity to finish that with a bachelor's degree uh, in an engineering discipline. And GRCC and Ferris are really set up for the working person. Uh, this is, these are people that uh, are working for a living, they're uh, you know, trying to better themselves, they see a future for themselves, uh, and GRCC and Ferris uh, really helped to enable that, being able to go through that and be successful at it. Uh, now I still look back on that as uh, a great time of my life, uh, and it's helped me to um, become the person I am. That's, uh, when you talk to people like Paul, and you talk to graduates who not only uh, is it important that they, uh, their education and their pathway, but it's also very important to people like Paul, Gentex, Hayworth, Herman Miller, AutoCam Medical, uh, it, it, the list goes on. It's so important that we are connected to our industry partners. We don't just take it for granted that we tell them what they need. <laughs> we ask them, what do you need? Uh, far be it from us to be an institution and a partnership that stands and tells uh, companies, oh, here's what you need. No, no, no. We sit down with the companies and we say, tell us what you need so that when we put together the, the certificate, the associate, the bachelor's, we want to put it together so that our folks, if they're going to go through it, we want them to get a job. And we want them to go in ready for the industry. And so it's a proud partnership that we have. And we're thrilled about it and look forward to many, many, many years in addition to what we're doing now of expanding partnership, but also thinking about what is next, because that's always important. And what I want to leave you with tonight is something that I typically share with some of my community college friends because I honestly feel this way about community colleges in what I we leave you with tonight as far as our time. And what I go from in this message, and I'll be very brief, imagine the college president saying they're going to be very brief. Good luck with that one, right? Sorry. 
I want to take you back to April of 1970. And in April of 1970, there was a certain mission known as Apollo 13. Apollo 13 included three astronauts and a large team of engineers and supporters. Those three astronauts, Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes, went up and the mission was to go to the moon. And the mission was to actually land on the moon and do work on the moon. But if you know the story, not everything went as planned. As a matter of fact, it went very bad. And for a while, our whole Earth was very concerned that these three astronauts might not make it back to Earth safely. And if you also remember, a couple of decades ago, there was a movie made about Apollo 13, named appropriately Apollo 13. And it included Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxson, Ed Harris, and several other actors. There was a scene in that movie that I want you to see. And that scene takes place, and whether it's true or not, I can't tell you, friends, whether it's true. I don't know. But in that scene, it is right at the time where they're trying to get back to Earth, and they're going getting ready to go into a period of just dead silence for about three minutes while everything, while communication was going to be cut off because they were on the other side, and they weren't sure after three minutes if they indeed would communicate again with mission control. That would mean that they were still alive going through, coming through the atmosphere, that little dead air that happens. The concern is that if you never hear from them again, it probably meant that they burned up re-entering the atmosphere. And so this scene takes place right as they're getting ready to go into that period of silence. And Mission Control is very concerned. Ed Harris plays a gentleman named Gene Krantz. He was Mission Control director. He was the one on the ground directing it all. Here's the scene from that movie. Roger, let's tie all the batteries on a main A and main B. Like they're still showering a bit up there. Do you want to tell them? Is there anything we could do about it? Not now, Blake. And they don't need to know, do they? Copy that. Can you still present this flash thing? Yeah. Parachute situation, the heat shield, the angle of trajectory of the typhoon is just some of the variables. I'm a little I know what lost. the problems are, Henry. This could be the worst disaster NASA's ever experienced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. That scene reminds me of you and I. Because if you couldn't hear it, in that scene, these gentlemen were saying, there's no chance. Can you imagine how big of an embarrassment this is going to be for NASA, that this is all going to be a big failure? Krantz looked at these gentlemen and said, with all due respect, I think this is going to be our finest hour. Friends, what we have been through in the last 20 months in higher education, aside from this, this whole country, what we've been through has been as challenging of an experience as I have ever seen in my career. I mean, I have seen friends of mine who have similar positions that have walked away. I can't do it anymore. They got in an institution past where they were and said, that's it. I'm done. I've seen students who said, I can't do this. This whole online, I can't do this. I got to be, I, I've seen so much happen. We have so much that we have endured. But we also know that we now have the opportunity of funding that is out there that Tom talked about earlier today, funding that comes to higher education that gives us something that we have never seen at this level in our generations, our generations before. The amount of funding that you and I have to expend to do things in our communities and on our campuses that we've never been able to do before. I will say to you, I believe this is our finest hour. And if we are not able, as higher education professionals, to leverage this hour, to leverage it in a way that will be moving not only for our students, but will be transformational to our communities, if we're not going to be focused on that, shame on us. And somebody ought to hold us accountable. 
Because when you have opportunity, and when you have the time period that we are in, that has been very challenging, similar to a mission that went wrong and was very perilous in how it was going to finish. So too have we gone through and we continue to go through, yet we are indeed, I believe, in our finest hour. The question is, what will we do with it?